Good afternoon, and welcome to Enhancing Board Member Effectiveness. In this informative webinar, we'll discuss best practices as they relate to the legal and financial aspects of governance for co-ops and condominiums. My name is Jules Frankel. I'm a shareholder with Wilkin & Gutton Plans CPAs and Consultants, and I'll be your moderator today. We're going to start by seeing who's in the audience today, and we have a couple of polling questions for you. So the first question that we have for you is, what is your role? Are you a property manager, a board member, or another professional? Please click on it so we can see what your roles are. And we'll give the uh, couple of minutes for everybody to do that. Terrific. So it looks, just so you know who the audience is, that approximately two-thirds of you are board members, and about a third of you are the other professionals. One more question before we introduce the panelists. How many years have you been on the board? One to two years, three to five, six to seven, over eight, or you're not on the board? Great. So about, about a third of you are not on the board, but almost half of you have either one to two years or a little bit more than that in experience. So we'll try and gear the comments to your particular uh, experience level. Excellent. So let me introduce the panelists for today's uh, webinar. They are Annette Murray, who is a shareholder with Wilkin & Gutton Plan. Annette joined the firm in 1984. She specializes in serving co-ops and condominiums, as well as the general real estate industry. She also services a number of closely held and family businesses, both in New York and New Jersey. Annette's client base includes a large number of co-ops, condos, community associations, assisted living facilities, senior housing projects, high-rise office towers, commercial properties, and owners of residential rental housing. She is the former president and treasurer of ICRU, the Industrial Commercial Real Estate Organization for Women, and a member of ARU, the Association of Real Estate Women. Bruce Colts is a partner with Rosen, Livingstone, and Colts, and joined that firm in 1989. He represents the firm's cooperative and condominium clients in complex sponsor defect and sponsor arrears litigation, shareholder controversies, commercial and residential non-payment actions, vendor claims, board election disputes, and governing document analysis. He has also negotiated and drafted commercial leases, management agreements, and handled several successful board election campaigns on behalf of both management and insurgent slates. Bruce currently serves on the New York City Bar Association Subcommittee on Co-ops and Condominiums. He has also served on the Condominium and Cooperative Lean Subcommittee of the New York State Bar Association, the Real Estate Committee of the New York County Lawyers Association, Cooperative and Condominium Subcommittee, the Association of Residential Boards Cost Control Committee, the Conda Co-op Council of Long Island, and the Queensborough Tap Queensborough's President's Task Force on Co-ops and Condos. I will now turn the presentation over to Annette. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're going to be covering quite a bit of material today, and there is a lot of information, so I'll be going through my presentation, and then Bruce will be following up after me. And in regards to the information, it's interesting that about uh, half the board members have one to two years experience. And I think that will be um, great from the standpoint of some of the material that I'll be covering because some of the items, some of the boards that we work with have dealt with a lot of these issues, but some of them have not. Some of them have decided that um, they don't, might not want to follow a particular practice and there's not an issue with that. But one of the reasons why we like to bring up um, discussions with the boards quite frequently, even though we might have in, this, in the past, is because a prior board might not have thought something was a priority issue, but the current board does. So we make recommendations, and sometimes the boards decide to uh, implement something a year or two after we might have originally suggested it. So what we're covering today, um, again, quite a bit of material, board responsibilities, board member training, use and training of committees, best practices reviews, management and operational audits, performance evaluations, oversight of management and employees, operational issues, the hot topic of reserves, annual audit and tax returns, a finance committee, 
building investments. We also, um, under board responsibilities, so we'll cover the first topic. <clears throat> I think one of the major responsibilities of the board and really part of their fiduciary responsibility is really to maintain the um, shareholders or unit owners values of their unit. Um, if, they can, if the unit values can be increased, that's terrific. I don't know that anybody would point to um, the board to say that's their responsibility, but it is something to keep aware of as board members make decisions. Is there anything that we're doing that could possibly decrease the value of a unit? So really that's probably the ultimate responsibility is maintaining the owner's values and maintaining a safe building. Um, and in this day and age, we know uh, for a lot of reasons this really is a challenge for all boards of co-ops and condos. Another responsibility of the board is really to set the tone for the building culture. And, you know, someone might be confused by that comment, but if you think about it, if there's a lot of communication coming from the board and management, I think the shareholders and unit owners are much more comfortable um, with what's going on at the building. They feel like they, they've got a buy-in with some of the decisions and things that get made. If the board comes off as secretive or not um, open-minded to suggestions from shareholders and unit owners, it really can cause negativity at the building. So the board and management really are responsible for setting um, the tone of the building culture. The board, as you know, is responsible for policy development and implementation. And I like to say that, um, you know, as we know, the majority of the buildings in New York have uh, managing agents and the boards are volunteers. But however, it is the board that does set policies, implements them, but then really gives direction to management to carry out their instructions. So that's a really important relationship, the one between the board and the managing agents. The boards are also responsible for strategic planning. And you might say, well, what kind of strategic planning, you know, would we have as a board of a co-op or a condo? Probably one of the key ones are long-term capital improvements. The board really needs to figure out, you know, long-term, how are we going to keep the building in good shape and maintain the value of the building? Um, we really need to address the fact that the needs of the shareholders and unit owners might change over time. So uh, a, a building might be offering a certain level of service right now, um, but it, over time they might decide that they need more doormen. Um, they want more amenities and things like that. Um, the, the needs of the building and the people living in the building can change. So some, every so often the boards really need to focus on long-term planning via strategic planning. And again, another key issue is continued financial stability. The board really is responsible to make sure that the building is in good financial oversight and um, maintaining good financial oversight is key to making well-informed decisions for the building. All right, next we'll talk about board member training. And it's very possible that most boards have not gone through any kind of, most board members have not gone through any board member training. But we really like to talk about best practices. And a best practice is not necessarily that there's a formal training, but that there really is someone, whether it's an experienced board member and or someone from the management company, really takes a new board member under their wing and lets them understand what their responsibilities are. And again, part of that board member training would give that new board member the understanding of what the role of the board is. Um, again, the board sets policies, it makes decisions. You know, you have, the new board member needs to understand they have to enforce the bylaws of the building and also comply with any legal regulations. And again, working very closely with the managing agent and all the employees of the building, obviously. Another really, really great best practice, um, which I don't think we see too often, but we're putting it out there, is really to create a book of key documents. Now, when I say a book, it doesn't necessarily have to be paper book, as we know we all want to go paperless. However, I think it's really helpful if when a new board member comes on board that they're handed a book or they're handed a computer file, which includes the bylaws, the offering plan if one's available, the key, key contracts, all the contacts that are important, including you know, all the professionals, the managing agent, a list of the employees. Um, and maybe descriptions of the um, major building systems and things like that, just general information about the building. And board members can bring this book to them to their, their board meetings, and then they could be handed new information as it comes in from the managing agent or via email and add it to them. So each board member, in effect, they could continue to grow their own book of key documents. So I think that would be a really helpful thing to have. The other thing that would get covered in board member training Again, um, a lot of boards don't have this, but this is really another best practice, is to have an ethics resolution or a conflict of interest policy. And this is where it's very key to consult with the, um, the building's attorney 
Um, you really should be working with your attorney closely on a lot of issues, and I think a conflict of interest and ethics policy is really, really important. And um, let's think about who else could possibly um, help with the training. And again, this is for new and existing board members, and I think um, who would be very helpful would be the accountant. We would always be happy to come in and help with the board talk about how to um, understand or review the monthly management reports, your annual audit, what are the tax issues that a building, whether it's a co-op or condo, has to deal with. So your accountant could help with um, new board member training or existing board member training. You, the attorney, your attorney would be happy to come in and spend time with the board, as well as your managing agent. So again, very important to think about. And I think we have a poll question now. So let's find out if any of your buildings does, or and again, if you're another professional, if you work with any buildings that have a conflict of interest policy. So does your board have a conflict interest policy or an ethics policy? So let's see here. We're getting some, um, oh, I'm getting some good positive votes here. OK. Got another minute or so. But I think, um, and again, if your board has not addressed this, it's really um, maybe you could take you know, the, the thoughts from this webinar and bring them back to the board that didn't participate in the webinar and talk about some of these things. So we're about three quarters of the way through voted, and right now about 25% of the audience has a conflict of interest policy only, and about 17% have both an ethics and a conflict of interest policy. Um, but we do have a pretty good high group there. Here's where we're at right now. I don't think everybody voted, but you could kind of see. Um, another thing that happens, too, that we've seen uh, on the ethics policy you know, there are certain things that get talked about in executive session, again, in accordance with the laws, um, that really should not be discussed outside, such as litigation and things. And what these policies do, it reminds the board members what their obligations are as board members not to discuss certain items outside of the boardroom, in effect, that would cause a problem with possibly litigation, personnel issues, and things like that. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, next we're going to talk about committees. Now, some buildings have no committees, and they might be small buildings, and we've got some very large buildings that have quite a number of um, committees. And committees can be extremely useful to boards. It really spreads the work around all the volunteers. And the boards really, if they haven't already, could figure out what kind of committees are needed or required. So, now, what are some of the typical uh, committees that you frequently see at uh, condos and co-ops? Right. I think the, most, the absolute most frequent one is a budget or a finance committee. So it might be called, they could have a budget committee and then a finance committee, and some of them also have an audit committee. Some of them just call it the budget finance committee, and they also um, handle the audit. Um, I think the, a budget finance committee is excellent because what it does, it, it gets some additional buy-in by some of the unit owners to see some of the tough financial decisions that the board has to make. Um, but I think board members need to be aware that if there's actually a formal audit committee, the outside auditors are supposed to communicate with the audit committee. So if you have some accountants, CPAs that want to volunteer, you could, you could ask them to be on the budget finance committee, but then this way, you know, it's just one less step through the audit process if the board didn't want to incur um, communication between the audit committee and um, the auditors. Uh, we also see sometimes, as you know, the lobby renovations are a very hot topic. So I've seen lobby committees. Maintenance committees, um, trying to figure out how to cut costs um, and things like that. Social committees, a lot of times there's uh, committees for a special project. We've got a number of buildings along the Second Avenue subway, and many of you might know what a challenge that's been. Um, so there's you know a special group of people. You might have an attorney or an engineer or somebody like that that volunteer to be on a Second Avenue subway committee. There could be a nominating committee for board elections, depending on how the bylaws are written. And a lot of buildings have newsletters or e-newsletters and things like that. And there's probably a host, quite a few of other types of committees. But what the board really needs to do in accordance with <clears throat> and see what the bylaws say is determine and communicate the roles, the responsibility, and the rules of the committees. Um, normally, there's a committee chair. And again, a committee might only be three people, but it really is best that there's a committee chair, and that committee chair is the one that communicates directly with the board so there's not too many emails going around. And what the board has to remember, and especially the committee members have to remember, is that the committees make recommendations, but they don't set or mandate policies. So they're usually recommendations to the board. The board takes, the, takes them under consideration, but then makes their own decisions. 
And um, again, going back to the board committee interaction, um, it's great to have the committees come in and meet with the board periodically, but the most important thing, I think, is to have that one point person or chairperson to make the communication. Um, what needs to be considered when setting up a committee, um, there's insurance issues. You want to make sure that you know, committee members get insur and, um, covered by insurance just in case something gets said or done. Um, legal issues, you want to make sure they're allowed by the, the documents of the building. Um, ethics policies and just operations, you know, everybody needs to be kept in line appropriately. So the right communications need to be done. And again, this is another excellent area to go to your management company as a resource as well as your attorney. All right, next we're going to talk about some best practices reviews. I think, um, you know, best practices has almost become a, a cliche, but it really is, a, I think, a very important thing to get looked at. I mean, you think about, um, the majority of the buildings, you're really running a small, or in some cases, a very large business. So best practices in the commercial world really does translate well to running of a building. And I think one of the most important areas in, um, to consider, and the boards are very aware as well as the management companies, is just how expensive it is to run the buildings these days, how much the common charges and carrying charges have gone up, and you know, really what can get done to take a look at expenses. And I think what many of us try and remember all the time, unfortunately, though, is that 80 to sometimes as high as 90 percent of a building's budget really is fixed due to union contracts, real estate taxes, mortgage, interest, um, insurance. You know, a lot of the major expense areas do not have any wiggle room, or they're really set by um, forces that the board has no control over. Um, that being said, when it comes to expenses, we really think on an annual basis and ideally through the budget process, an analysis of each line item gets done. And this is a great way to get the budget committee involved and you know, maybe even break it up into several, several members on a budget committee. But really, what could be done without, without cutting services of a building, if possible, to really get the expenses done? And are we really doing best practices in each area? When it comes to real estate taxes, the certiorari attorney should be engaged each year. And that absolutely should get done you know, on a co-op. As you know, the building gets the benefit. Um, and in, we see many condominiums have the certiorari attorney uh, go for the real estate appeal or the assessments to be looked at on um, behalf of all the unit owners. And that's really, um, we've seen that be successful very many times. One of the largest items on the budget um, that has to get dealt with is energy and utilities usage. Every building should have a utility study. Um, and as we know now, there's benchmarking requirements by New York City and other kinds of mandates. But again, from a standpoint of saving money, a best practice is to have a study done and to see how the building could benefit. And again, we know we have the uh, changeover in the um, oils also. So those things need to get done, but how could they be done in the best way? When it comes to building services, equipment maintenance, um, a really big issue I think best practices is the bid process. You know, how to go about um, what, what is the building's bid process and working with the management company. And for very large contracts, Field bids really should be considered. Security, some, and depending on where the building is located, um, security is more of an issue um, in some places than others. And I think the board and the uh, residents really need to think about cost versus benefit. Um, again, everybody wants a safe, secure building. And um, you know, it really is a good way to bring in um, you know, a couple of companies to take a look. You know, what way can we get some safety without spending a tremendous amount of money that the building possibly can't afford? Staff pay, now we know that the majority of the buildings do have unions involved, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But for the non-union employees, um, I think the boards and manager want to make sure that you have competitive pay, and you really want to keep the best staff. Because I think, um, as most buildings know, when a really key person leaves the building, what a nightmare that can be. And uh, a lot of times the residents don't realize how important that good staff is. And sometimes paying them just you know, an X amount of dollars per year makes a really big difference. We'll keep them from looking other other places. I think another really important best practice is emergency preparedness. Uh, you know, does each building have written procedures to distribute to the residents? Um, what to do in, the, in case of the different scenarios that could possibly come up? But the board of management really should take a look at that every year and update it. I think an example would be just about a year ago, we went through the hurricane that came through. And for some buildings, they really did have some flooding and wind damage and issues and stuff like that. And uh, from what I understand, you know, management companies did do a good job communicating what to break, take off the balconies and, as an example and things like that. Union contract provisions, 
Um, as we know, the buildings are tied into unions, but a key best practice here really is to have um, a good union attorney to really make sure that the uh, building is doing everything that it should do under the union contract. And as, if any issues come up with any employees, that you make sure you deal with it in accordance with the union rules and regulations, really important. Insurance, a best practice is to absolutely do an annual insurance review for the types of coverages and then the limits on the coverages. You don't want to leave out any kind of coverage. Um, people, as we know, don't really like to spend money on insurance, but we see a lot of cases where the insurance, uh, there are insurance claims and then it turns out the coverage wasn't what it should have been or the, the limit amount really wasn't what it should have been either. All right, next we're going to talk about management operational audits. And this is a case, again, a best practice where you could bring in um, a professional from the outside or um, it could be done with management or, and even volunteers or committees. Um, there's many, many services um, that a building undertakes and, for exa example, maintenance schedules. There's um, operational maintenance schedules such as having a, you know, a lobby floor polished every so often and then there's equipment maintenance, boilers and elevators. The better that the equipment and the um, common areas are maintained is the less that the major repairs and replacements are going to have to get done. Um, I'm going to skip down to engineering studies. Now here we're really talking about having an engineer come in and take a look at key um, components of the building so that you, the board knows when reserve projects, major projects have to get done and then the board has some uh, time lag in, um, in order to prepare and figure out how the building is going to um, pay for these items. Another thing that needs to get done is record retention. I think um, many of the major management companies have gone to paperless, but I think it's very important that a board has a good understanding with the management company is what records are being maintained, for, so, for how long, where are they being maintained, how are they being restore, uh, destroyed when appropriate, and what records have to be maintained permanently. Some buildings have on-site offices and on-site storage, and other buildings don't. But um, you know, that really is a project probably that one board member could undertake if it's not been done lately. Inventory, ideally there should be an inventory of major equipment um, that's really not affixed to the building. Uh, you want to make sure with the um, employees in the super that, you know, um, that someone's keeping an eye on the equipment and nothing major is walking off, but if there's not really a list of the major items, um, you know, that could easily get lost in a shuffle. Again, I'm mentioning again the insurance about going out to bid. Um, building plans and warranties, they really should be maintained by the super or somewhere on site if possible. And again, that's kind of going back to that key documents book, but this is the same thing. There, someone should have all of the information really in one place um, so that if there is an issue, um, the board or the uh, staff are not scrambling to try and find out what kind of warranty or um, paperwork they had on a certain project or piece of equipment. Same thing with the operating manual. Administrative files, the same thing. You know, who's responsible for what types of administrative files and does somebody have a good handle on the requirements with that? All right, let's see, performance evaluation. This is a little um, less of an issue for, um, again, union, but this is when um, we have in-house staff that's not union, but one of the key areas is management company and the agent. Um, internal staff, again, non-union. Legal, outside, your outside legal counsel, your outside accountant, your investment advisors, the engineers, and all your vendors and consultants. Really, best practices are they providing very good service, are they available when needed? Um, you know, are they timely responding to you? Um, are the fees competitive? And again, when you have any major contracts, <coughs> excuse me, with these um, outside vendors, again, consider sealed bids. Next, we'll talk about oversight of management employees. So the board really should have some idea of what the requirements are, obviously, with the union. And again, going back to have a good labor attorney. Um, as we know, the union rules really dictate substantially all of these practices we have up on the slide. But some of our buildings do not have union employees, some of our smaller buildings. So therefore, the board really needs to work with management on all these items and make sure, ideally, that they have an employee handbook. Um, and that employee handbook should be current and get updated every one or two years and work with that labor attorney to make sure something's in place because if something's not clear, or um, it looks like favoritism is being done amongst um, employees, that's a lot of times when litigation gets um, started. So that's a strong recommendation there. Now we're going to talk about some additional operating issues. Now what I think is, um, as we know, the board members are volunteers. 
and we know you don't get paid to do the, the great job that you do, but I think it's important for the board members to remember that everything that goes on in the building, good or not, unfortunately is the ultimate responsibility of the board. And while the board delegates a tremendous amount of um, its responsibility to the management companies, you really can't advocate your responsibility. So as the boards um, do financial monitoring and make all these major decisions, um, unfortunately, the responsibility does come back to the board. So we just have to remember that, um, keep that in mind when you're making those decisions. So the responsibility for the annual budget, while you work with the management company, the final approval of the annual budget and the final decisions on some of the line items really is with the, with the board. A key, key piece of running a building is monitoring the monthly management reports the board really must look at and understand the monthly management reports. And that goes back to some of the board member training when there's a new board member. If possible, um, the management company really could have someone sit with the new board members and make sure they understand all the financial aspects of the building and what all the different monthly reports mean. And a key piece of that is really understanding the monthly financial statements contained in the monthly management reports, which includes your actual versus budget performance for the month and the year to date. And it's really important that the board throughout the year understands how it's um, doing year to date, and that will help them make good decisions um, for the rest of the month, and it also helps them prepare for next year's budget. The board really needs to understand by a conversation with the management company what internal controls and, um, that the management company has, and how the management company can also help them with cost controls at the building. Um, some buildings want to have signatory power on the reserve account, um, or certain spending approval, you know, with signatures. So there might be, you know, if there's any contracts under, you know, $10,000, you know, just sign them, take care of them. But anything above $10,000, we want board approval on. Other things to think about, um, that the buildings have potentially other sources of income. As we know, a number of buildings have garage income. They might do in-unit services. Um, there might be holiday funds, uh, which get collected uh, for employees. You know, the board needs to be aware of how all these um, items work and that they're being handled properly. Same thing with payroll practices and controls. These are good conversations to have with the management companies. And here again, mentioning again record retention. Work with the management company to know where the records are being maintained and for how long. Another issue that's come up the last couple of years and in the budget the last couple of years is FHA approval and probably the one that's been most controversial is the 10% reserve requirement in, um, in each annual operating budget if they want the building to be FHA approved or for unit owners to um, get mortgages. So, you know, we're probably going to have a whole other program on FHA approval, but um, you should be aware that you can work with the management company on that, and if you have any specific questions about FHA approval, you know, you can type in a question, we'll see if we can help, but if not, uh, send us an email. Okay, I'm almost done here, wrapping up. Reserve, very hot topic. The board really needs to evaluate the needs for long-term capital projects. Uh, consider sealed bids for long contracts. You really should be using, um, you should definitely always use an outside certified engineer to take a look at the major components of the building. But you can use um, board members or uh, unit owner shareholders who are accountants or engineers to help. It could save money, but you still really ultimately need to rely on your outside professional. We strongly suggest that boards put together with management and your engineer, a five-year capital plan. And it really keeps the board and management focused on what needs to get done and where the funds are going to come from for the next five years. If you're interested, we have a very basic Excel template. Um, please email us um, from the emails on there, and I'd be happy to send that to you. And it really just starts you with your reserve, your beginning reserve balance, say, as of the first of any year, what projects need to done, get done, and then where you're going to get the money from. It just carries it over a five-year period. Next, I'll just talk quickly about the fact that uh, substantially all the buildings have an annual audit and the buildings have to file annual tax returns. The annual audit is really the responsibility of the board to make sure it gets done, and um, that's really one of the main um, financial responsibilities that the board has. There's various aspects to the audit. The engagement letter is the letter in which the auditors get hired. The representation letter is representations coming from the board in which they understand their obligations as board members um, in regards to the audit. And again, the board is ultimately responsible for the audit, not the management company. There's something that's issued called a Staff 114 letter, and that's required communication to the board. 
and then there's another letter that gets issued sometimes called the SAS 115 letter, which would communicate any internal control deficiencies. We don't see those issued too often, but that is a way for the um, auditors to communicate. And when you get your annual financial statement from your auditors, there's one or two pages which contains the auditor's opinion letter. letter. That's the only page of the financial statement that is the accountant. The rest of the financial statements are the building's financial statements, which are the responsibility of the board. So that's important to remember. They're not the auditor's footnotes, they're the auditor's financial statements. When it comes to the legal letter, as part of the audit process, we um, almost always send a legal letter to the attorney, and that helps us see if there's any disclosures that might be required in the footnotes to the financial statements, or if there's any legal fees or settlements that need to be disclosed or accrued. Now, when it comes to the tax returns, Co-ops and condominiums are two different types of legal entities, and they do file their taxes under two different methodologies. But for the most part, uh, buildings file federal, New York City, and New York State um, tax returns. And the boards really should have a general idea of you know, the purpose of the forms and, and what the building's obligations are there. Another question we get asked about often is, what is the um, distribution of the annual financial statement and access to records? What are best practices there or what's required? First, you always go look to the bylaws to say um, what's the requirement there. And if it's not required that they get sent to all unit owners, um, they really should, could be available by electronic copy on the website, or um, they could be mailed via snail mail. And the last couple things I wanted to talk about is the Finance Committee. We did talk about that a little a bit earlier, the budget and the Finance Committee, because it really is a key committee that really could um, help the board out quite a bit. And the Finance Committee should work closely with the treasurer and the treasurer, again, report back to the board. And another um, item I wanted to talk quickly about is the building investments. As we know, interest rates right now are historically low, um, but we really feel strongly that buildings should not invest in anything in which there's risk of loss of principal. That's kind of our firm policy. Um, but it would be great if there's a written investment policy for the building, so this way future boards um, follow what the current board or past boards have thought is very important. And you really should um, have a good financial advisor, though, to help, even though the interest rates are low. Um, you know, there's a lot of good advisors out there to help figure out maybe how to ladder investments and things so they're available for the major um, improvements when needed to get done. So, and that, that was great. There was a ton of information. A ton of information. Call us an email. To, to absorb. Um, as a reminder, we're going to be taking questions at the end of the uh, presentation. But a number of you have already written in asking about the five-year capital plan. And you can uh, email us at info at wgcpas.com to get a sample of a five-year capital plan. I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Jules, and to all board members, especially the new ones, congratulations on your election. Now you're all in a position to directly influence policy, day-to-day -day affairs, and the quality of life in your communities. That's heady stuff. But board membership is not your proverbial stroll in the park, because along with the prestige and power within your community that board membership confers, it also confers numerous grave legal responsibilities and obligations. The purpose of my presentation is twofold. First, I'm going to review your extensive powers as board members and show you how, when those powers are properly wielded, the courts will operate to protect you from legal liability against those shareholders or unit owners who may feel offended by your exercise of power and sue you. But even more significantly, I'm going to review your major legal responsibilities and obligations and point out the pitfalls which could potentially lead to liability, board liability and even your personal liability and in some cases your um, possibly in some extreme cases criminal liability. So if you take a look on the screen you'll see a description, a generic description of your powers as board members called from your governing documents, co-op bylaws and proprietary lease and condo bylaws. What I'd like you to, and what I've done is I've uh, broken them down into enforcement powers, 
and policy making powers or management powers. But what I'd like you to take away when from reading the, this description is the pervasive influence that the exercise of these powers has on the members of your community, the residents. For example, um, when you establish cash requirements and levy maintenance and common charge increases or special assessments, you are determining perhaps their biggest uh, monthly outlay, their monthly living costs. Um, when you set policies, you are basically telling your community residents the rules by which they have to live. When you determine the manner in which they're enforced, you're basically telling them how they have to live their lives. Inevitably, because of the vast extent of these powers and because of human nature, when you exercise your powers, somewhere along the line you're going to offend your residents, some of them, especially if they're lawyers and don't have to pay out in order to fund their litigation, will sue. So the question becomes, what do you do in order to protect yourself against liability when um, somebody does sue? And that's where the business judgment rule comes into effect um, and comes into play. You probably heard a phrase called the business judgment rule. Um, what it is, is one of the most important legal doctrines affecting co-op and condo board members. And when you exercise your powers properly and appropriately, the business judgment rule comes into effect to act as a shield to help you defend against liability suits by dissatisfied shareholders or unit owners. Here's how the, what the business judgment rule is in plain English and how it works. The business judgment rule comes into play when you issue a, a controversial policy decision or house rule or, uh, or you enforce powers that you, policies that you've already enacted and somebody resists. They challenge you in court, challenge the validity of your regulation. Really, all they can do is say one of two things. They could either say, judge, it's illegal. What they're trying to do is illegal. Don't let the board get away with it. Or, judge, this is really stupid. It's arbitrary. It's capricious. It's unreasonable. Don't let them do it. Well, what the business judgment rule says is when you're, when you're the policy or the regulation is legal in all respects, then the court has to uphold that decision, that board action, and cannot, no matter how crazy the court itself thinks the regulation is, if it's legal in all respects, the court has to rubber stamp it and say the board can do it. And if shareholders or unit owners are that unhappy, they have a political remedy. They could throw the board out at the next election. Now, what do I mean? The operative phrase is legal in all respects. What do I mean by that? Well, the state, New York State's highest court, the Court of Appeals, adopted a four-point test in the decision of Lewandowski versus One Fifth Avenue Owners Court um, in discussing what is legal in all respects. The first is Quite, the first test is, is the action consistent with the association's governing documents? Secondly, is it otherwise consistent with all your statutory obligations and case law governing the powers and operation of board members? Third, does the implementation of that action result in a breach of fiduciary duty that board members have to your shareholders and unit owners? And finally, is the action, and I'm putting this in quotes because this is taken directly from the decision, in furtherance of a legitimate purpose of the association? And now, that's a very easy test to follow if you're to, to satisfy. If you, you can, any board can come up with any kind of rationale that um, 
something is in furtherance of the community's interest to justify their decision. For example, if a board decides to mandate purple shades in all windows, that's arbitrary, it's capricious, it's crazy, it's zany. But they can say that uniformity, exterior uniformity of appearance in the building is uh, within the association's best interest, and that's why they're uh, telling everybody they've got to put purple in. Um, so that satisfies that test. Now, the business judgment rule says if all, if the regulation or board action passes all any one of those tests, then it's not legal. If it's legal in all respects, then the business judgment rule operates to shield the board from liability for the exercise of its powers in making the decision or enforcing the policy. If it's not legal in all respects, then the court can strike it on grounds of its being illegal, and then the court can weigh in with its opinion on how crazy the, um, the policy or the provision is. So that's what the business judgment rule um, says. Now, I think let's, let's do a polling question before we get to your next section. Sure. And let's see what the uh, audience thinks here. OK, we're the polling question. OK, which of the following is not typically within the unilateral powers of the board? Determine necessary building repairs amend the bylaws to set new voting procedures, set and amend guidelines for subletting, or the board may perform all of the above. So it's which doesn't belong. OK, it looks like a very significant portion got the right answer. Amend the bylaws to set new voting procedures. The reason being that amending governing documents almost always requires for a shareholder or unit owner approval. OK. That is, that covers the heady part of the presentation. What are your board powers and how do you make them stick? Now let's look at the other side of the ledger, your responsibilities, your legal responsibilities and obligations. and what happens, what could happen when you breach those responsibilities and, ha and what I'm going to explain is how a breach of those responsibilities will void the protection of the business judgment rule and expose you to liability including personal liability um, by virtue of your participation in the board action. Basically, as you can see from the screen, there are four different categories of legal responsibilities, the major ones, contractual responsibilities, statutory responsibilities, your duty of care as board members, and your fiduciary duty to shareholders and unit owners. I'm going to very briefly describe each because uh, I have only 20 minute presentation, so I can't really get into that. Step, but the contractual responsibilities are the board's obligations as set forth in the community's governing documents. In a co-op, that's the corporate bylaws and the proprietary lease. In a condominium, it's the condominium bylaws and to a much lesser extent, the declaration. If it's a, a homeowner's association, that too is the, the homeowner's association bylaws and if it's a, a affordable housing project, it's the HPA regulations, uh, doc, HPD doc, documents. Um, now, um, what happens basically is your governing documents will express your obligations as board members in one of two ways. Either it'll be an affirmative obligation, like the board's repair obligation to repair and maintain certain aspects of the unit as opposed to other aspects of the apartment, which are the shareholders or unit owners' obligation to repair and maintain. Otherwise, in the governing documents, there may be specified limitations on the board's 
ability to exercise any of its powers. For example, if you are going to borrow money, it's a very common, um, and, and the board is given the right as a business decision to decide to borrow money uh, on behalf of the association, very often in your bylaws, there'll be a limitation that it requires 50% or two-thirds shareholder or unit owner approval to authorize the borrowing. So sometimes it's an affirmative obligation, other times it's a limitation on what's otherwise a grant of authority to the board. As board members, you need to be very well versed in your association's governing documents so you have a working knowledge of your powers and your limitations and your obligations under those governing documents. If you implement regulations in breach of those legal respond uh, of those uh, of uh, those contractual responsibilities. You are, in effect, violating the first test of the business judgment rule because your actions are not consistent with the association's governing documents. And therefore, if anyone challenges the your board action, it, you're going to lose the protection of the business judgment rule because you flunked the first test. Okay, secondly, let's take a look at, the, at statutory obligations. Okay, what you see um, under, there are four, basically four different, um, four, four, four different um, categories of statutory obligations. There is for co-ops, co-ops are governed by the business judgment, uh, the business corporation law. The business corporation law um, determines governance issues um, um, of uh, board member obligations to shareholders and unit owners. Uh, yeah, shareholders. Um, secondly, there's the real property law for co-op. Um, um, governing co-ops, and that is, um, as you know, if you're a co-op board, you're also a landlord to your tenant shareholders, and the real property law governs landlord-tenant um, issues. Um, then, there, for condominiums, there's only one statute, the Condominium Act. It's the be-all and end-all of uh, condominium, a condominium board's relationship with its unit owners. Um, Thirdly, there's the Housing Maintenance Code, which imposes repair obligations on both co-ops and condos. And finally, they, there are discrimination statutes. So why don't, why, don't and, we, why don't we test the audience knowledge on discrimination for a second here. Let's pull up a polling question on that. Okay, the polling question is, a board may, true or false, a board may never make a decision based upon discrimination. True or false? Okay. Um, okay. Um, it is a myth, an absolute myth, that boards may never discriminate. The, the reason it's a myth is that discrimination basically means that any, any uh, uh, discrimination exists if anyone is treated differently than anyone else in any regulation. Boards do have the power to discriminate except that Congress the state legislature, and in, if you're in New York City, the city council has legislated 16 basic categories of discrimination, which they feel as a matter of public policy are particularly offensive. And it's only if your regulation affects any one of those 16 categories that you are engaging in illegal discrimination. And that's the fourth kind of um, statutory um, um, is discrimination that affects both co-op and condo boards that you have to avoid. Um, okay, um, the next um, 
is the next um, obligation is the statutory um, duty of care. Basically, the, a co-op board member has to, or a condo board member has to do a good job, has to exercise a degree of competence. What that competence is, is you are not expected to be a Steve Jobs, what you're, you don't have to have the business acumen of a Steve Jobs. What you have to do is have exercise reasonable care within your community. And the fact of the matter is, in New York and New Jersey, there's so much information out there um, telling board members what their obligations are, is it's a pretty high standard of care. You basically have to be well informed so that you can properly oversee your professionals and cast rational votes. The second part of your obligation of due care is to exercise independent judgment. You can't just say, I'm going to follow John, my board president, because I like the way he thinks, so I'm going to defer to him and not read up on the issues and not challenge him. I'll always be a vote in John's pocket. You have to exercise your own, um, your own independent care. Now, fiduciary duty is the fourth obligation. Basically, it's an abuse of power. Um, let's say you meet another person. Here's how it works. You meet another person. That person puts his trust in you. As a result of that act of faith, you gain a position of power and influence over the person um, who put his faith in you. And he's dependent upon you. What that means is you are his fiduciary. And even though what you might otherwise be uh, able to do legally, if you are his fiduciary, you still have to, in addition to um, abiding by the law, you still have to take his interests into account. And that means that you have to, you can't, by an abuse or a breach of fiduciary duty is an abuse of your power because um, you, he's depending upon you to, um, to serve his interests as well as your own. So um, a breach of fiduciary duty is an abuse of power. In the co-op condo, condo context, the, um, the shareholders and unit owners elected you with their votes. They gave you all the powers that we earlier discussed. As a result, you are in a fiduciary duty. You can't abuse those powers. And that means you can't enrich yourself at shareholders or unit owners' expense. You can't um, use your powers to fuel a vendetta against particular shareholders or unit owners in your community. And you can't treat some shareholders differently from others. You can't selectively enforce your rules and regulations. Otherwise, if you do that, you're in breach of your fiduciary duty, and the business judgment rule will not act to, to help you. Bruce, talk, talk a little bit about board members' personal liability. OK, well, there is a new decision came out in early July. Before that decision, Fletcher v. Dakota, Inc., board members were shielded from suits for personal liability. If as long as they were acting as board members, if they, if you, you had to um, assault a shareholder or do something other than acting in your capacity as a board member to be exposed to personal liability. As a result of the Fletcher v. Dakota decision from July of this year, board members who participate in wrongdoing, even if that wrongdoing is within the scope of their official duties as board members can be held liable personally to shareholders or unit owners who are challenging their actions and held liable for damages. And um, what, what that does is it really places an incredible burden on board members, most of whom are not attorneys and can't really be expected to know what is legal wrongdoing. Um, when they cast votes, and um, and the, under this Fletcher v. Dakota decision, if you vote for 
a board action that results in wrongdoing, you are participating, quote unquote, in um, the wrongdoing and therefore you're per personally liable. So what you should do is, to the extent possible, educate yourself by going to training programs, seminars like this. Ask a lot of questions of your professionals. Seek opinion letters from uh, your attorneys. Don't be bashful about running up fees on uh, nominal fees on an opinion letter because you can rely on the attorney's advice in an opinion letter um, in order to avoid personal liability. Also, state, New York State law at least allows um, Fords to adopt exculpatory provisions in their bylaws. But notwithstanding this uh, permission from the state legislature to um, have, uh, have uh, bylaw provisions which say that um, shareholders can't sue board members for negligent conduct, many boards have not adopted those bylaws. And you should consult your attorney to uh, see if uh, your building has adopted them. And if not, hasten to do so. OK. It's about a minute to one. We thought we would have some time for questions, but it looks like we've run out of time. We will try and answer some of these questions via email. We'll direct them to the professional who can help you. I want to thank both uh, Bruce and Annette for the uh, wealth of information that they shared with us today. I want to thank you, the participants, for attending this webinar. If you have any suggestions for us in the uh, future, for future webinars, please email us. Our uh, speakers can be reached at the emails that are being shown on the screen now. Annette at amurray at wgcps.com and Bruce at bac at rosenlivingston.com in New York. We again thank you so much. And if you have, again, any further questions, they can be sent to info at wgcps.com. Thanks again for joining us and have a terrific afternoon.